At this point, I'm going to go ahead and uh, introduce the speaker. Um, it's kind of funny. When we talk about the Northcutt uh, murders and the Northcutt trials, um, I've been in, interested and involved in local history for a number of years. And about every six or eight months or so, I would get a, somebody emailing me, phoning me, what have you, if I had any information on the Northcutt uh, murders and the trial. And this was happening fairly regularly, and, and up until that point, I hadn't heard of it. So I started doing some delving into it and the like, um, and found it was a very fascinating, if not dark and twisted, portion of our, uh, of our county's history. Well, not all that long ago, maybe no more than a couple months or so, uh, Jeff Paul called me all the way from North Carolina, saying that he was just putting out a book on the Northcutt uh, murders, and would I be interested in uh, uh, having him out here to speak? And of course I said yes. And so without further ado, I'm going to have Jeff come up here and start to talk about his book entitled Nothing is Strange with You. And he's going to explain that title uh, to you here. And all of his research to do with the Northcutt uh, murders. So without further ado, Mr. Paul. <laughs> Good afternoon. Uh, can everybody hear me? Yes. Yeah. That's good. Well, 80 years ago, a very twisted, but very, and very tragic, but very meaningful and fascinating horror came to darkened Riverside County's history. And ladies and gentlemen, I hate to say it, but eight decades later, when it seemed as if it had been buried with the sands of time, the horror has returned. Thanks to myself, thanks to um, Hollywood and Mr. Clint Eastwood and Angelina Jolie. And I hope that um, in discussing this event today that you'll realize what a truly fascinating and unique case this was. I hope that you'll become aware not just of its morbid voyeuristic fascination, but I hope you'll become aware of the human reality and the human depth and meaning in this awful event. I might as well begin by reading the first page of my preface, and we'll proceed from there. The story was beyond comprehension. On a tiny chicken farm in Riverside County, California, a young man had established a terrible despotism. He had kidnapped his own teenage nephew and forced the boy to wait on him, hand and <coughs> foot. He would beat his nephew regularly and savagely with any weapon that came to hand. Whenever the urge took possession of him, he would sodomize the boy, thus committing incest, as well as what was termed the most infamous crime against nature. The young man would regularly prowl the streets and byways of Southern California looking for small boys. He would bring them back to his chicken ranch, have his way with them, and then, most of the time, let them go. Sometimes, if they knew too much and had stayed at the ranch for too long, he would hit them over the head with an axe and kill them. He would force his nephew to hit the boys with an axe as well, and then to help him consign the children, sometimes still living, to their graves. But there was more. The boy's doting mother, who had apparently never harmed a flea in her entire life, loved her son so much that she helped him commit his crimes. When her son wanted to shoot one of his victims, she advised him that using an ax made less noise. She told her son and grandson that they must all strike a blow in this affair and that if they were caught, they would share equally in the guilt. When her son wanted to kill a mother and father, so that he could enslave their sons, a project that failed, she helped him every step of the way. When the young man was finally caught, he presented a bizarre picture to the public, or rather, a bewildering <coughs> kaleidoscope of pictures. He was a perfectly normal and presentable looking young man, but his face constantly changed. One moment it wore an insufferably smug grin, the next a thoughtful, mature look, the next, a childish smirk that some people found girlish. The next, the truly terrifying, hollow-eyed look of a predator who has scented blood. 
His behavior, too, was similarly malleable. One moment he would huffily deny his crimes and assert that he had been framed, and the next make confessions so lurid and bizarre that they were almost laughable. He could dissolve into hysterics or adopt an aura of learning and dignity beyond his years. He defended himself in court for the most part and adopted a double-pronged defense. He was innocent, yet crazy. He blamed it all on his father, a harried, frightened, cowed person, claiming that this harmless-seeming old man had sodomized him when he was young. Furthermore, he alleged, he was the product of an incestuous union between his father and his older sister. This was an obvious lie, but his mother backed him up on it. And the father continued to love and assist the wife and son who had libeled him so shamelessly. The young man, whose name was Gordon Stewart Northcott, scarcely seemed human. Perhaps he wasn't. He was covered with body hair, a seeming throwback to man in his primordial bestial state, and so they called him the Harry Ape Man and the Harry Ape Boy. At any rate, the young man's, the young man's paper-thin bravado did not last. When Stewart was taken to the gallows for his crimes, he dissolved into hysterics and asked for a blindfold the only time in the history of San Quentin prison that a prisoner had walked to the scaffold blindfolded. The mother, Sarah Louise Northcott, served over a decade in prison for her role in one of her son's crimes, then lived out her days in pastoral obscurity with the husband she had betrayed. The nephew, Sanford Clark, who had been subjected to treatment befitting a Nazi or Soviet concentration camp, vanished into obscurity seemingly condemned to a lifetime of terrible memories and nothing else. Such is the presses of this story. But as I found in the nearly 20 years I've spent digging into it and uncovering fact after startling fact and after pursuing so many false leads down so many blind alleys, accidentally <laughs> stuffing up a valuable three-foot piece of historical gold chain. And um, I'd like to share some of my discoveries and my findings with you today. Um, but before we go any further, I understand that some people here in the audience have some connection to this story, that some people in our audience are descendants of supporting players in this case. Uh, is there anyone here who is and would like to identify him or herself? <laughs> I, I didn't mean that uh, your descendants had anything to do with the crime. <laughs> <laughs> um, in, well, anyway, because of um, we are um, under time constraints, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk for a short period about several aspects of the case, and when I reach the end of each little mini talk, I will open the forum for questions. First, uh, just some basic facts about this very elusive character. Gordon Stewart Northcott was born almost certainly on the 9th of November, 1906, in the Canadian province of Saskatchewan. He was born either in Bladworth, where his parents lived, or in the nearby town of Davidson, where the hospital was located. His parents had been married for about two decades beforehand, and they had given birth to a daughter Winifred, whose um, son Sanford the, her family would use so cruelly, and they also gave birth to about four other children, none of whom <coughs> survived infancy or childhood. One child, I believe named Willie, died at about the age of six, and Sarah Louise, his mother, <coughs> went more than a little crazy, let us say. She nearly, she almost died herself, her husband said. She, her, she was just so unhinged by grief, not only, I guess, at the loss of this child, but at the loss of the other children who had preceded it to the grave. And then Stuart <laughs> came along, and she, as George would 